drops are falling on my head, they keep falling. The moment I wake Sunday night at 7.30 on MPT. University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. Leading the way on Chesapeake Bay restoration while guiding our state, nation, and world toward a more sustainable future. Claim your future through UMBC's new graduate programs in software engineering. Providing modern approaches to software development and implementation, UMBC's faculty is ready to help connect you to resources and opportunities in this in-demand field. Are you a Maryland renter at risk of being evicted due to COVID-19 related issues? Help is on the way with Maryland's Emergency Rental Assistance Program. You may be eligible for assistance in helping to pay current or past due rent and avoid the threat of eviction because of wage loss or illness due to the pandemic. To learn more, visit rentrelief.maryland.gov or call 877-546-5595. State Circle is made by MPT to serve all of our diverse communities and is made possible by the generous support of our members. Thank you. Connecting Maryland to their government. This is State Circle. Good evening, welcome to State Circle. In a moment, we will preview next week's special session of the General Assembly, and we'll hear from candidate for governor, Wes Moore. But first tonight, the Omicron variant has been detected in Maryland, adding to concerns about another wave of the pandemic. Nancy Amato reports. I think if you're, if you're vaccinated, if you're boosted, if you wear your mask, I think it's going to be okay. Sentiments echoed by Governor Larry Hogan after confirmation that the Omicron variant has been identified in the U.S. Our state will not wait to launch our preparedness efforts, and Marylanders shouldn't wait either. In Germantown. I'm vaccinated. I'm boosted. Um, I do. I stay home as much as I can. Holiday shoppers say with so much unknown about this new variant, they are back on high alert. For a large part of the population who has been vaccinated already, I think it does not present this immediate concern for fear. Infectious disease scientist Dr. Wilbur Chen says it's unclear if the Omicron variant is more transmissible than the Delta variant and how severe or harmful it is if contracted. We are hopeful that the existing vaccines will continue to protect. It may not be 100% protection, but that's not what we should expect from all these vaccines. And so some protection is better than no protection. So for people who remain unvaccinated, again, it's another reason to uh, get fully vaccinated. The governor and health officials are urging boosters for those who are eligible to get one, but it appears not everyone is so eager to roll up their sleeves again. I mean, I'm not fully comfortable with getting the, the booster shot again or getting the booster shot, period. Um, and, you know, I'm hoping that the two that I have so far is working and it's keeping me safe. I think there's a lot of fear mongering, like they want us to live in fear. Um, those that are in control, but also I think the vaccine people are making a buttload of money. I'm not against it, but, you know, I'm just not too much trying to keep on getting injected with different stuff or whatever it is. With the holiday season in full swing. I am concerned that there are a lot of people with COVID fatigue and just are willing to just say, I will just throw caution to the wind and do whatever I want. And I want to just warn people that you're making that decision, not just for yourself, but for the people around you who, who haven't made that decision yet and maybe are uh, immunocompromised or older and will be susceptible to getting very severe infection and possibly be hospitalized and die because of that decision. Now the Maryland General Assembly will convene Monday morning for a special session. The main focus will be drawing new congressional districts following the recent census. Maryland's current map has been criticized as one of the most gerrymandered in the nation. It was drawn 10 years ago with a stated goal of increasing the number of Democrats in Congress. At least two maps will be introduced next week, one from a legislative committee that appears less garbled in central Maryland, but opens the door for a Democrat to possibly win the Eastern Shore-based first district. And there's another proposal from a commission appointed by Governor Hogan. That one features more compact districts, but is not seen as having a chance to prevail.
We spoke with former Congressman Albert Wynn, who represented the 4th District in the U.S. House from 1993 till 2008. Congressman, thank you for joining us. I, I heard you on NPR talking about this, and you said that redistricting is the essence of politics. What do you mean? Well, in terms of a legislative body with, you know, partisan characteristics, each party's trying to gain political advantage. In redistricting, the every 10-year exercise that we do, it's an opportunity to shuffle a deck in your favor if you control the state legislature. So Democrats do it, Republicans do it. It's, it's the essence of politics. So if it's the essence of politics, then uh, anybody looking ahead to the, to the Maryland General Assembly coming in next week, maybe they're a, a good government advocate, maybe they're a Republican or an independent, and they're hoping that this will result in some sort of nonpartisan outcome, uh, they, they shouldn't hold their breath. That's correct. I mean, this is a phenomenon that takes place all across the country. Districts are drawn to, as I say, create a political advantage to eliminate opponents, or in some instances to protect uh, people who might be vulnerable. It's, that's the process. And, you know, Democrats here, point to Republicans in Texas and other places who are gerrymandering the heck out of their maps. And I'm sure in, in Texas, they put up a, a picture of the, you know, the Maryland third congressional district as the poster child for it. And, and nobody really wants to unilaterally disarm. My favorite phrase, no one wants to unilaterally disarm, which is to say, you know, the Democrats, good government and all are not planning on changing the way they do it unless the Republicans were to change the way they're going to do it. Because as we were speaking earlier, it's all decided at the state level in state legislatures, the chance of a change is not really that great. By the way, one thing viewers may be wondering, since you used to represent the fourth congressional district in Maryland, uh, current uh, incumbent Congressman Anthony Brown is leaving that seat to run for attorney general. You don't have any interest, you have a successful uh, legal career, lobbying career, you're not planning to get back into the game, are you? Not at all. <laughs> My time has come and gone. <laughs> one, one of the things that results from this, I mean, you get a lot of crazy maps all over the country, but you, you wind up with an increasingly partisan uh, Congress. Do you, do you agree with that? That's the fundamental problem. Uh, districts are drawn either blue or, 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 or red, and so that means that when people run, they run from the extremes. In other words, if you're in a red district, you're gonna give meat to the Republicans, you're gonna take extreme positions, the more extreme, the better. If you're in a blue district, the same thing occurs. You're gonna take the most uh, progressive views that you can take, which means that the people who get elected are not inclined to compromise because they ran, run on extreme positions. Their voters elected them based on those positions, why should they change when they get to Washington? So you get people who come to Washington based on ideology, not based on the desire to legislate. And, and they have to worry more about the next primary than they do right. about the next general election. Absolutely. It's all about being, quote, primaried. Uh, so the, the considerations are, first of all, uh, the individual incumbent survival. He's concerned about that, and he's pushing a redistricting plan that protects his survival. Uh, and then you have the partisan consideration of, okay, we got to make this uh, district as blue as possible, or uh, we've got to make this district as red as possible. And, and you combine that, the, the increasing polarization of Congress with the increasing polarization of, of the media, and, and then you wind up with people who live in a world where they're in a, a, a really blue or really red district, and they're watching either really red or really blue media and, and have no idea there's another world out there. That's absolutely true. We jokingly say from the sidelines, a lot of these people come to Washington to get on TV, not to legislate. Uh, one of the particular problems, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention it, with redistricting, sometimes minority communities are exploited either by splitting them or packing them to engage in this redistricting process. So you'll have a district with an overwhelming number of minorities uh, so that other districts will not have any minorities. And that is part of that process of creating an extremely blue or an extremely uh, red district. 
And again, you split up split communities, uh, you some, many times undermine minority representation, and that's, that's very problematic. Well, you represented a, a district, and, and maybe around the time it was drawn that way, um, that was intentionally drawn as a majority minority district. And I, and I think the law says you have to do that when there's an opportunity to do it. Well, yeah, and uh, in that instance, it made sense. But there was a question, and I don't want to go too far in the weeds, but sometimes the question is, well, how many minority uh, voters do you need in the district to make it a reasonable district for you know diversity purposes uh, before you reach a point where people are packing all the minorities together so they won't be in other districts where they might influence uh, the outcome in a different way. So you will find uh, Republicans delighted to pack as many minorities as they can in one district so those minorities will not be in other districts where they could you know pressure uh, the candidate to perhaps be more progressive or more liberal. You know, when you, when you think about Maryland, we have um, eight congressional districts, two are uh, majority minority as things stand now. You wonder in, in a state where the African-American population is, in, you know, not quite a third of the state, should there be a third district that's, um, I don't know, designed to elect or, or somewhat favorable for minority candidates? It's certainly doable. Uh, there are a lot of political dynamics. I mentioned incumbency being one uh, that and that strongly influences how those lines are drawn. And incumbents say, well, no, no, I want to keep these folks in, in my district because that helps me win, as opposed to maybe having them in another district where they would constitute uh, a more viable uh, minority uh, voting bloc. Former Congressman Al Wynn, thanks very much. Now, as we continue our series of interviews with the candidates for governor, we're joined by Democrat Wes Moore. Mr. Moore, thank you for joining us. It is my joy, Jeff. It's great to see you. Let's start with your biography. When you meet a new voter for the first time, you have a, a varied background. How do you introduce yourself? Well, I introduce myself first as saying I'm a, I'm a proud Marylander. Uh, this is where I was born. This is where I I came of age. This is where I've had some of my most uh, amazing and traumatic memories. This is where I fell in love and where my wife and I are raising our kids. Uh, and, and I'm running for, for governor because when I think about my life experience, uh, when my professional experience, whether it was I was I led soldiers in combat as a paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne Division uh, in Afghanistan. I came back and I started a, a successful small business here in Maryland that was focusing on helping students with a first in their family go to and through college and making sure that we can provide the supports for them to make it actually through college. And for the past five years, I've been the CEO of one of the largest nonprofit organizations in America, where just in my time as CEO, we've allocated over $650 million towards housing, transportation, uh, education, early childhood, mental health, criminal justice reform. And knowing that the, our ability to be able to invest smartly our ability to be able to work with community members, work with work with the private sector, work with work with government, are all things that make me uniquely qualified in this moment to be able to be the next governor for the state of Maryland. So you have a long list of accomplishments uh, at a young age, not including any political experience, I believe. When when did you decide you wanted to run for governor of Maryland? Hmm. Well, you know, I, I've I've been a a public servant for my entire life. I just haven't been a politician, uh, you know, and I knew early in my life that I wanted to be a public servant where, you know, I was four years old when I watched my father die in front of me and he died because he went to the hospital and he was unshaven and his clothes were disheveled. And, uh, and there was assumptions about whether or not he had insurance. And he, when my mom got to the hospital, they asked her questions like, is he prone to exaggeration? And he was released from the hospital with the instructions to go home and get some rest. And if it got worse to come back and he died in front of me five hours later and I watched my mom become a single mom who is now going to raise three kids on her own. She didn't get her first job that gave her benefits until I was 14 years old. So I knew from an early age that I was going to spend my life fighting for people like my mom, fighting for people like my dad, fighting for so many of my neighbors who for in our state, it's a remarkable state, but but opportunities readily available to some. It's just dangerously absent to others. 
And so I made the decision that I was going to run for governor because it doesn't take long to see that we're at a tipping point. That, I, that, that, that our state is wrestling with this, with our ability to grow inclusively. And none of us should be satisfied with the fact that we have some of the best schools in the country sitting next to some of the most underfunded and underperforming, that we have some of the best hospitals in the world, yet people who live down the street from them can't afford to be treated in them. And I think about what I learned in the army. We learned a simple principle when I was in the army, and that was this, we leave nobody behind. And that's the mantra that I wanna to bring to the state of Maryland. When, when you talk about having uh, raised and, and allocated hundreds of millions of dollars at the Robin Hood Foundation, uh, attacking issues like you describe, including health care, what, what do you learn from that in terms of what works, where, where that money uh, can be effectively spent, where maybe it can be, uh, that can be improved on? Yeah, you know, I, I, learned, I learned so much running you know, one of the largest uh, nonprofit organizations in America, where we were able to identify what works, put capital behind it, and with a core focus on scaling. As a leader, I am very data-driven and heart-led. And I think we we're able to make massive improvements in the lives of individuals during my time there. I also, though, know this. If we are not fixing the systems that continue to allow people to fall between the cracks, then we are just cleaning up the debris that comes from broken systems. And as I go around the state and I'm talking to people, whether we are, whether we are in Western Maryland or the Eastern shore or, or the Baltimore region or the DC suburbs or central Maryland, the things that I'm hearing from people, whether we're talking about a parent who's saying, my child is suffering from learning loss after what they just had to endure whether it's the worker who said, I've lost my job, and it's not just that the job is gone, but the entire industry is now gone. Whether it's the person who said, I just went through a great job training program, but I don't have the transportation to be able to get to where the job is. You realize that these are not new problems. These are generational problems. And what we need to do to address generational challenges, we need a measure of generational change. Find ways where you're having the government that's meeting people where they are, and then partnering with every sector of our society to be able to make concrete and systemic changes in the way we live and grow and thrive in the state of Maryland. You know, uh, we've talked to a lot of candidates. Of course, everybody's really talking about similar goals when it comes to education and healthcare and the environment and, and other issues. Is there a place where you feel that you stand apart and an issue where, where maybe you take a different tack? Yeah, well, I, I think it's both on, on, on the issue and also the experience to be able to go and get this work done. You know, I'm proud of the fact that I have had a chance to see change in public service from many different sectors of the American economy. I'm proud of the fact that I'm the only candidate in this race who's been a small business owner. So when we're having conversations with and about small businesses, this is not academic to me. Uh, you know, I've had the, 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 the opportunity to sign both the back of checks and the front of them. You know, I'm proud of the fact that I've been a, a led one of the largest nonprofits in this country. And one of six people in this state are actually employed by nonprofit organizations. And I'm proud of the fact that I understand the role that nonprofits are going to play in order to create the kind of changes that we need to see, how to create a 21st century education system, how to create a world-class transportation system that's moving people from where they live to where they work, how to focus on housing and making sure that, that housing should be a human right and we should be focusing on making sure that people are in housing and staying in their housing. And so it's both about the issues and the aggressiveness that I think we can push forward. But it's also, I think people are seeing, even when you look at the endorsements that our campaign has received, the momentum that our campaign has, that it's both about the issues that are gonna show a measure of differentiation, that we're gonna focus on work and wages, and wealth and economic opportunity, but it's also a unique ability to work cross-sectoral to get this work done. You picked up some endorsements uh, this week from a couple of well-known uh, members of kind of the, the democratic establishment in Maryland, which, which is noteworthy because as we mentioned, you're not a member of the democratic <laughs> establishment in Maryland. Uh, I, I, I've been honored in the fact that, uh, you know, we've seen so many people uh, who have been spurned by this campaign over the, uh, the past several months. And, and, and to your point, just this week, you know, we've received the endorsements of two former chairs of the Maryland Democratic Party, Susie Turnbull and Mike Cryer. Uh, the first sitting county exec, county elected official to endorse in Montgomery County 
uh, Councilman Will Jawando back to my campaign, Senator Cheryl Kagan from Montgomery County back to her campaign, the only sitting county executive to endorse in this race. And Aroma County Executive Stuart Pittman endorsed the campaign. Senator Obi Patterson in Prince George's County has endorsed our campaign. And I'm proud of the fact that I'm also the only uh, candidate in this race from the Baltimore region. And over half of the Baltimore City Council and delegation has endorsed my campaign. And, and you, you, you bring up a really important point, Jeff, because these leaders are not endorsing me because they think I'm a nice guy, right? They're endorsing me because they've seen me work. They're endorsing me because I've had a chance to work with them in our communities on legislation. They're endorsing me because they believe in my vision for the state. And they're endorsing me because they know that I have a unique path to win, not just in the primary, but to win next November and to actually finish and accomplish a job that for Democrats in our state has been so complicated and been so challenging over these past 20 years. Well, tell me more about that unique path to winning in November, because of course the Democratic Party pretty much runs everything in the state, but has lost three of the last five elections for governor. Why, why do you think that is? Why should uh, party insiders and, and regular voters look to you as the person who can win next November? Yeah, and, you, and you're absolutely right. I mean, if you look at the past 20 years in the state of Maryland, and Maryland is a, a two to one registered Democratic state, but the reality is, is for the past 20 years, we've elected a Republican governor for 12 of them. And, and I think back to something that, uh, that County Executive Stuart Pittman said when he endorsed me, uh, when he endorsed me uh, about a month and a half ago. Uh, and he endorsed early, which a lot of people were really taken that you have a sitting County Executive who's up for re-election, who endorsed so early and endorsed the candidate who, uh, who's never run for office. And he made it some really important points. He was very complimentary of my vision and my values and the work that I've done. But also he said this, he said, I think Wes is the person who's uniquely prepared to win in November. Uh, and he said, because to win in November, you have to do two things. You have to both energize the base and not alienate everyone else. You have to energize the base, but also go after the disinfected voters. And, and the reality is, that's what I've done for my entire career. Our thanks to Mr. Moore. As we continue to talk with the candidates, all of the interviews will be posted online at mpt.org slash ask the candidates. Now the signs, they are changing. Well-known local bank brands SunTrust and BB&T are now Truist, and sign companies have been busy putting up the new logo at local branches. We spoke with Greg Farno, Truist Regional President, about what consumers need to know. Mr. Farno, thank you for joining us. I'm sure those sign companies are happy to see uh, consolidation in banking, but from a consumer standpoint, in terms of their old checks and debit cards and all that, what, what do people need to know? Well, Jeff, first of all, uh, yeah, those sign companies are doing a great job right now as, as we will be switching out our signage at thousands of locations over the next uh, few months. But, you know, what we want it to be for the consumer is seamless. Um, you know, if a consumer says, I didn't realize your systems converted, um, that's exactly what we want. <clears throat> you don't want them to, to see anything. What you want them to see though, is more robust, enhanced uh, platforms, capabilities, technology, more than they had before, but done in a seamless way. And so that's what we want the consumer to see through this merger of SunTrust and bb and into Truist. It's been a lot of hard work at uh, the regional level, but also locally for, for your team. Absolutely. You know, bringing two big banks together is not easy. Um, we've now been at it, Jeff, the, the merger closed in December of 19. So it's coming up very rapidly on two years. Uh, the pandemic slowed it down a little bit, <clears throat> but we've been very, very uh, diligent taking our time, being methodical, figuring out which bank's system might be better than the other and, and, and developing that. Um, our physical assets, thinking about branches, offices. I'm, I'm talking to you today from downtown Baltimore, where we consolidated <clears throat> our two big office buildings into one. And you'll see that happen from New Jersey to Miami, to Dallas 
So a lot of that going on, Jeff. I know you have a nice view behind those blinds of downtown Baltimore, but a lot of the the businesses that have been headquartered in the original downtown near Charles Center in in Baltimore have been sort of migrating over to to the Harbor East area. Was that something you looked at? Yeah, So, so Harbor East is beautiful, Jeff. Lovely area. We're very proud to have it as part of the city. Both Heritage SunTrust and BB&T, though, have always been anchored here in what, what I would call the downtown or central business district. So we felt it was important to continue that um, and to make a statement that we believe in the whole city of Baltimore, but are committed to downtown Baltimore. Um, and that's why we put both of the offices together and kept it in the central business district. Um, again, Harbor East is, is wonderful and it's not far away, but um, downtown Baltimore has got a lot to offer as well, Jeff, and um, we're proud to be here. When this is all done, what, what is uh, Truist going to look like from a, a regional uh, Maryland standpoint in terms of uh, number branches, assets, that sort of thing? Yeah, and, and, and so let me, let me uh, give you some idea. Um, we've got offices, and when I say the offices, not branches, but business offices all over the state, you know, Hagerstown, Frederick, Owings Mills, Hunt Valley, uh, Columbia, Annapolis, Baltimore, um, Ocean City. Um, so we, we, we really are dedicated to serving the entire state of Maryland. Um, we do that through a vast uh, branch network. And Jeff, that network was evolving before the merger. It'll evolve through the merger and and after the merger as as our clients determine how they want to be served. So some clients still like going to the branch. Some would rather do it digitally. Um, And we've seen an enormous growth in digital transactions. You know, companies that are customers that would uh, like to interact with us um, through the computer, on the phone, versus going into a branch. So, so we continue to evolve our branch model. Some branches you'll see are closing. Generally, Jeff, those are ones that are a, a quarter of a mile, a half a mile away from another branch. Um, we're opening up branches. Uh, we opened up a brand new branch here in Baltimore City on North Avenue, right as you enter Coppin State. Our thanks to Mr. Farno, and that is State Circle for this week. For all of us at MPT, thank you for watching and have a good night. This program was made by MPT to serve all of our diverse communities. Programs on MPT are made possible by our members and the following. There are risks when buying drugs like heroin, cocaine, crack, and pills off the street. But did you know that any of those drugs could also contain fentanyl? Fentanyl is an opioid 50 times stronger than heroin, and it contributed to over 80% of overdose deaths in Maryland.